if you read Carolina Journal, and I hope that you do, um, there was actually, let's see, do I have the wrong one here? Oh, goodness, I do. Oh, no, no, I'm looking for the one that had the example from 2012. Well, I'll tell you what, here's what, you can have it back, please do. Uh, we actually did some, some reporting on some things having to do with occupational licensing. And what went on here was Steve Cooksey, who was um, a guy who was a blogger about a diet that he had actually decided uh, worked for him. So he started a blog and he told people, here's what happens with, uh, with this diet when I blog or when I, when I use it. And he was telling people online, hey, maybe it'll help you too. Well, he ran afoul of one of the state's boards. I believe it was called the Nutrition and Dietitians uh, Board, and they went after him, essentially. The Institute for Justice got involved in that case, and uh, Dick is going to be telling you about um, what happened with that case and some others. People may not even realize that a lot of these different boards exist and engage in what's called occupation, occupational licensing, in which uh, they can make it very difficult for people to try to make a living. So the Institute for Justice is very helpful in going around state to state and trying to challenge uh, these different activities to make it easier, to make it more free for each and every person to try to earn a living using their, their trade or their craft. And he's compiled a lot of these stories in his new book called Bottleneckers, Gaming the Government for Power and Private Profit. And he co-authored this book. By the way, this book will be for sale following Dick's presentation, $20, and he has agreed to stay after the presentation and sign these if you'd like to purchase a copy. Uh, it's interesting, he divides his time between Colorado and Virginia, so he's constantly back and forth flying um, over the country, and we are so grateful that he joined us today. In terms of occupational licensing, our own John Sanders, who is Director of Regulatory study, Studies, has done a lot of research on this. You may have read some of it online. And he notes that uh, we have more than 150 job categories that are licensed in North Carolina by more than 50 licensing boards. Now that's pretty amazing. And you might be amazed to find out what some of those job categories are. They include locksmiths and landscapers and hair braiders, people who are required to have a license to engage in economic activity. So what is this all about and perhaps more importantly, what do we do? What reforms should we be looking at? For that, we turn to our guest, Dick Carpenter from the Institute for Justice. Well, good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I'm going to begin this afternoon by introducing you to Kim Powers Bridges. <clears throat> Kim owns and operates Bridges Funeral Home in Tennessee. But Kim has not always lived in Tennessee. In fact, Kim is an Oklahoma native. And that's where she started her first funeral business. But she was forced to leave the state of Oklahoma when she ran afoul of the law. It turns out that Kim was engaged in the very dangerous practice of selling caskets without a funeral director's license. Before that, in the early 1980s, Kim was on the executive fast track. She grew up in a family of hardworking entrepreneurs. And early on, she learned the relationship between hard work and success. So when she left college, she worked in a series of different companies, and she was very successful in each of these. She ended up working for one of the nation's largest funeral companies, and there she sold pre-need funeral services. And she saw this as a way to combine her drive in business with the desire to help people through her work. And you will not be surprised to learn that she was very successful in this business as well. But in classic entrepreneurial fashion, she noticed that there was a need or a niche to be filled in the funeral business. Because it turns out, in the funeral industry, the merchandise, particularly caskets that are sold, are marked up anywhere from 250 to 600 percent. So Kim began thinking about, how could we sell the same merchandise, but at a much lower cost? So after a few years, she left this company, 
She partnered with Dennis Bridges, who had also left the same company, and they spent a year forming what became Memorial Concepts Online. And as the name implies, they would sell all of their merchandise, again, particularly caskets, online only. They would have no inventory. Instead, their business model was to take advantage of direct shipping from manufacturers. And therefore, they could keep their overhead costs very low and they could pass those savings on to consumers. They thought they had a winning business plan. And they did, except they ran into a problem. And the problem was Kim was not a licensed funeral director. In Oklahoma, if you're an Oklahoma-based company and you wanted to sell caskets to consumers in Oklahoma, you had to have a funeral director's license. Now, Kim could have earned this license, but she would have to go back to school for two years. She would have to embalm 25 bodies. And then after that, she would have to open a brick and mortar business in which she would have a selection room, a viewing room, a preparation room, inventory on hand, none of which they were interested in. Now, Kim could have taken her business, which was just computer servers. She could have taken those servers and moved them across the state line to Kansas. And there, she could have sold caskets all day long to people in Oklahoma. But she didn't want to do that. She wanted to stay in Oklahoma. She wanted to raise her family in her hometown of Ponca City. And she thought the law was wrong, and not only wrong, but injurious and irrational. Because not only did it require that she have a funeral director's license to sell a box, that's all a casket is. It's just a big empty box. The law also created a circumstance where companies in Oklahoma, based in Oklahoma, could not sell to consumers unless they had a funeral director's license. But companies outside of Oklahoma could sell to people in Oklahoma without a funeral director's license all day long. So Kim could have moved her servers and then she could have sold these caskets. But she stayed in Oklahoma and she fought the law. And she was not alone in thinking that this law was wrong. It turns out some state legislators believe the same thing. In 1999, these legislators began introducing bills year after year after year to remove the licensing requirement for the sales of caskets. Kim testified on behalf of several of these bills. And each year they lost. And they lost for one reason and one reason alone. Licensed funeral directors went to the legislature and they lobbied aggressively to protect their license. And because of the power of the funeral industry in Oklahoma, they were actually able to kill every one of those bills. So to this day, if you want to sell a casket in Oklahoma, and you are an Oklahoma-based company, you have to have a funeral director's license. So what Kim and the state legislators ran into was what we describe in the book as the bottleneckers. A bottlenecker is somebody who advocates for the creation or perpetuation of an economic regulation, particularly an occupational license, in order to restrict the free flow of workers into an occupation and enjoy an economic benefit as a result. So this issue of occupational licensing has grown in attention in recent years. In fact, the Obama White House released a report in 2015 on occupational licensing. This report was actually skeptical of occupational licensing. An occupational license is, in essence, a government permission slip to work. And these licenses exist throughout the economy. Most of us know that our doctors, our attorneys have to have licenses. And I think many people realize that your barber or your cosmetologist has to have a license. But because of the growth of licensing in recent years, now, as we heard earlier, now we have occupations that require licenses that you can't even imagine. Auctioneers, locksmiths, sign language interpreters, crane operators, upholsterers, florists, and the list goes on and on of occupations that now require a license to practice. <clears throat> for 25 years, we at the Institute for Justice have worked to reform occupational licensing. If you're not familiar with IJ, we're a nonprofit public interest law firm that fights on behalf of individuals whose most basic rights are violated by government. And amongst our issues is economic liberty. Economic liberty is the right to earn an honest living free from unnecessary government regulation. And we've represented individuals like Kim and others 
uh, some of them here in North Carolina, to exercise their right to earn an honest living. And along the way, in 25 years, we've noticed that there is a myth that persists about occupational licensing. And the myth is this. Legislators create licenses at the request of harmed consumers and concerned citizens. The truth is, legislators create licenses at the request of people in the industry to be licensed. And at first blush, it seems absurd. Why would anyone ask for more government intrusion into their business? But the key to answering the question, like so many, is to follow the money. Those in the industry come to realize that by putting a bottleneck in place, by creating a license, they are able to keep their competitors out and artificially inflate prices and wages as a result. So think of the funeral directors and their ability to mark up their products uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 600%. But it's not just an economics issue. When we hear bottleneckers make requests at state legislatures, they very typically will say something like this. We need this license to give us a certain status. This license will give us recognition that only a license can provide. We want to be like these other professions and these other occupations that are already licensed. So it's no surprise then that when a reform bill is introduced in the legislature or a license is challenged in court, the bottleneckers mount a ferocious campaign in order to protect their license. We at the Institute for Justice have been doing this work for 25 years and we have yet to find a single license that is created or protected by any means other than bottleneckers. But this myth persists that there's some sort of demonstrable need and that's why the license exists. So we wrote the book because we wanted to dispel this myth of how licenses come into being. The second reason we wrote the book is we also wanted to coin a new term, a word that could be that could be descriptive and useful and accessible and perhaps most importantly pejorative. We wanted a word that could be used to name and shame people who engage in this activity or who enable this activity. So with bottleneckers we drew on the well-known metaphor of a bottleneck, something that restricts free flow or free movement. So think of the bottleneck in traffic and the negative freight associated with the word. Think of the two-hour morning commute because of the bottleneck in traffic. That negative freight just enriches the metaphor all the more. So each industry that we cover in our book, from cosmetologists to dietitians and nutritionists, have exhibited classic special interest behavior, what we call bottlenecking behavior, in order to create or protect their license. And this is what it looks like. It will typically take the form of coordinated letter writing campaigns to the legislature, crowding out legislative committee rooms, industry day at the Capitol, special awards to legislators, campaign contributions, personal lobbying inside of a legislator's office, and going to committee hearings and filling testimony full of unsubstantiated facts and scary sounding anecdotes. So a classic example was in Florida. A couple of years ago, the state legislature in Florida considered whether to repeal a licensing requirement for interior designers. If you want to work as an interior designer in Florida, you must spend six years in education or training and pass a national examination offered by the interior designers in order to work in this occupation. So the governor and the legislature all wanted to repeal a series of these licenses and one of them was interior design. So when the legislature finally took this up, they were overrun by licensed interior designers. They spent not hours, not days, but weeks in testimony considering whether to repeal this license. And it was one licensed interior designer after another from the state and from outside of the state going and giving testimony about why this license is so necessary. One person said that if they were to repeal this licensing law, it would result in the deaths of 88,000 people <laughs> per year. Our book is somewhat backward looking in that 
we examine the history of what we call bottlenecker activity. We examine the history of bottlenecking activity across various different occupations. But this is not some historical artifact. This is something that continues today. And there's no better example than the American Music Therapy Association and its sister organization, the Certification Board for Music Therapists. These two organizations have mounted a nationwide campaign to license music therapy. And when they make their request, their language is the same that bottleneckers have used for years. We, we talk about it in the book. For decades, they have said the same thing. We need to protect public health and safety from the scourge of unlicensed music therapy. <laughs> now, regardless of what one thinks about the occupation, the value, and we make no judgment about it, there is simply no evidence of a significant threat to public health and safety such that this license is necessary. It has been practiced freely and safely for years. And the fact that some states have already adopted regulation is not because consumers have broken down the doors of the legislature demanding to be protected. It is because the music therapists have been successful in going and lobbying to have a bill to license their particular occupation. Now, lest anyone think that this is happening just in some far-flung place, it's happening here in North Carolina as well. Here in North Carolina, a bill was introduced just a couple of weeks ago to license music therapy. The bottleneckers, the music therapy bottleneckers in North Carolina have been active since 2006. That's when they, fir they first formed a task force. The national organization has what they call a regulatory affairs team. And then they coordinate a series of state-based task forces. And they go state by state asking for a license. So in North Carolina, the task force formed in 2006. The first bill to license music therapy in North Carolina was introduced in 2011. And as is often the case, it takes a multi-year effort to have these licenses created. So the latest was just introduced last week with, in the form of House Bill 192. So this, act, this type of activity continues. Uh, more than a half dozen states have already created a license for music therapy. And in many of these states, the licensing requirements are quite severe. So one of the most severe is in your neighbor to the south, Georgia. Georgia created a music therapy licensing bill just a couple of years ago. If you want to work as a music therapist in Georgia, you now must earn a bachelor's degree or higher from an approved music therapy program. And the program has to be approved by the Music Therapy Association, the same people that lobbied for the bill. You will complete 1,200 hours of clinical internship. You will pass a national examination that is offered only by the Music Therapy Association. You'll pay more than $300 for that privilege. You'll pay fees to the state. You have to be 18 years of age or older, and you have to pass a criminal background check to work as a music therapist in Georgia. Research on occupational licensing indicates that now consumers in Georgia and North Dakota and other states that have adopted this law, consumers will now pay anywhere from 15 to 30 percent more for their music therapy services. But they will not necessarily get anything more in terms of greater quality of service or protection of the public. And if at some later date the Georgia legislature were to consider reforming the licensing law, they will be overrun by licensed music therapists who will be joined now by the state music therapy licensing board who will go to the legislature and they will lobby aggressively to protect their license. So we mentioned Steve Cooksey at the beginning. And Steve Cooksey's case is a very interesting one because up to this point, I've talked about how bottleneckers seek to protect their industry by regulating who comes in, keeping some people out, making sure that people who are engaged in the commercial transaction of their goods or services are regulated by their board. But Steve's case is interesting because Steve was not actually involved in commercial activity. Steve was not paid for what he did. He was merely speaking. So now what we see are bottleneckers who attempt to bottlenecker nothing but speech. People who just talk. So Steve's case is this. Steve grew up in North Carolina. He still lives here. 
he was a very active young man in his teens and 20s, played several different sports, really great shape. Uh, was very successful, worked in accounting, eventually went into management, and then ended up working in management at a medical device company. He was very successful at doing this. But his job was extremely stressful, as you can imagine. And so uh, he would work 12, 14 hour days. He was exercising less and less. He was working in a high stress, high pressure job. And so consequently, Steve ended up gaining an enormous amount of weight and his health began to decline significantly. So Steve um, was, was uh, he had hypertension and he had plantar fasciitis and he, and uh, you know, one ailment after another, when I talked to him, he said, if you were to open my medicine cabinet, it looked like a pharmacy. I was taking all of these different drugs to address all of these things. I didn't know what did what and what interacted with what. I have no idea. I was just taking all of this medication. Eventually, it became so bad that on Valentine's Day in 2009, Steve ended up in the hospital on the verge of a diabetic coma. So while in the hospital, he was told that he was now type 2 diabetes and then he needed to take insulin the rest of his life, and he was crushed. But it was galvanizing for him because he decided he was changing his lifestyle. He was told in the hospital he needed to change his diet to a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. So then he went and started to do research and he discovered that was actually the opposite of what he needed to do. And so he changed to what is called a paleo diet. So he ate almost all meats, vegetables, nuts, food that was only available to people in the Paleolithic era. So no more sugars, no more refined processed foods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He only ate meats, vegetables, nuts. And the consequence was this. That was Steve on the left, and this is what Steve on the right looks like today. Changed his life completely. So as you can imagine, with something like this, he became an evangelist for the paleo diet. He started his blog, The Diabetes Warrior. He talked about his experience. He made recommendations based on his own experience. How can you have the same experience as I? He began receiving emails from people. People would email him with questions and their experience. He began posting the questions and answering them in kind of like a Dear Abby type style. And then one day, he received an email from the Board of Dietetics, Dietetics and Nutritionists. And attached to the email were 19 pages of his blog, red-lined, telling him how he was operating as a dietitian and, dietitians and, and nutritionist without a license, telling him that he needed to stop. And if he didn't stop, he was exposing himself to severe action, cease and desist letters, fines, et cetera, et cetera, potentially even jail. Well, as you can imagine, Steve was very upset by this. He changed his blog, and I should note that on his blog, he had disclaimers that said, I am not a doctor or a nutritionist or a medical professional of any kind. He made it very clear. But he went and he changed his blog to comply with what the board said. And for a few weeks, it gnawed at him. All I'm doing is talking. And not only that, but people are being helped by what I'm saying. He was very troubled by it. So eventually, we hooked up with Steve, and we represented him, and we took his case to court. We sued the state but, uh, because of their actions. We went to court, and we lost. So we appealed. And on the appeal, the judge found in our favor. And they sent, the judge sent the, the case back down to the trial court and told them that they needed to revisit this as a free speech issue. But the good news is we never got that far because the board recognized the writing was on the wall and they changed the law to allow Steve and other people like him to operate their blog freely. So today, if you go to Diabetes Warrior, you'll read about Steve and his experience, and you'll be able to read his advice unfettered. These are the type of people that we represent, people who merely want to exercise the right to earn an honest living or to speak, uh, to speak freely. 
Often those of us who advocate for reform of occupational licensing, we do so by making economic arguments. Chip and I do this in the book. But this is more than just an issue of economic growth. This is also about creating a just society. A society built on, in part on the right to earn an honest living free from unnecessary government regulation. Friends, there's nothing just about the government telling someone he may not work in the occupation of his choice or for which he is best suited simply because it introduces too much competition for someone else who's more politically savvy. In 1787, James Madison wrote that the protection of property rights is the first object of government. And to Madison, property rights extended to more than just real estate or personal property as we typically think of it. For Madison, property rights covered, quote, everything to which a man may attach a value and have a right, including opinions and the free communication of them and the free use of his faculties and the free choice of the objects on which to employ them. Madison's disdain for the co-optation of government for one group at the expense of another was unequivocal as was his inclusion of economic liberty under the rubric of property rights. Here's how he said it, quote, that is not a just government, nor is property secure under it, where the property which a man has in his personal safety and personal liberty is violated by arbitrary seizures of one class of citizens for the service of the rest, where arbitrary restrictions, exemptions, and monopolies deny to part of its citizens that free use of their faculties and free choice of their occupations, which not only constitute their property in the general sense of the word, but the means of acquiring property strictly so-called. In condemning, quote, arbitrary seizures of one class of citizens for the service of the rest, and quote, arbitrary restrictions, exemptions, and monopolies, Madison very well could have been talking about occupational licensing today. He could have been talking about bottleneckers today. So to fulfill Madison's call for a just government, to execute the first object of government, elected officials should protect property rights of our citizens, including the right to occupational practice. And those of us who love liberty, we should prod legislators toward reforming occupational licensing. And we should support those who work to break open bottlenecks on behalf of the types of people that we've talked about today to expand economic liberty. In 25 years, we've represented men and women like this all over the country. We tell the story in the book, Bottleneckers, about how licenses are created, but we also tell the story of courageous men and women like this who have worked to break open bottlenecks in their own industry, not just for themselves, but to expand economic liberty for millions of other people. So for 25 years, we've been doing this work, and we're going to continue doing this work until we restore economic liberty, the right to earn an honest living to the place that the founders envisioned as one of the most important rights that we have.